yes, uh, hello. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, so I will uh, read my speak and not uh, talking by myself. So I apologize about it. So uh, let's start. Um, greetings, everyone. I hope you have a good lunch and won't fall asleep during my presentation. To make uh, sure of that, I've added a fun picture to this slide, <laughs> first slide. But don't worry, the rest of presentation will be more mature and serious, I hope. Uh, so I'd like to talk about how we at Edgar uh, are adapting to Manifest V3 and what has changed since our last presentation a year ago. Let's go. My presentation can be divided into three main sections. Uh, first one, the past. Uh, a brief introduction to what MV3 is, what we have accomplished so far, and quick overview of how it works. Next one, the present. The key challenges we have faced it and continue to incur daily in our efforts to maintain the filtering quality and the level of our current extension. And the next one is the future. Several ideas of how to make uh, MV3 even better. In, uh, in the MV2 version, uh, we had the ability to use blocking uh, web requests where all our filtering actually took the place. Extension proceed each request on the fly and decided what to do with it. In MV3, uh, the blocking web request was removed and the browser will now decide what to do with each request. It will do using the new API called declarative net request within which extension, which extension must declaratively describe what processing to perform for each request. In addition to this change, background pages were eliminated, replaced by a new concept called service workers. The new manifest also contains many other changes, including changes to the execution of context of content script pages and many other. However, in this presentation, I will focus on the first three points as they are most important for our work. Initially, MV3 was planned to be fully rolled out in June 2023. However, thanks to close collaboration between the web extension community group and extension developers, many improvements are being introduced and various aspects are being refined. Therefore, the implementation timeline for MV3 is currently unknown. Maybe at least three hours until next <laughs> Chrome presentation. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Uh, for MV3, we have developed a separate prototype and launched the first ad blocker on MV3. Currently, it's being used by over 15,000 users weekly. Filters are updated every two or three days, and it replicates almost all filtering elements available in our main extension, except, for example, stealth mode. So let's take a look. This slide shows uh, all, all all of our options available for network filtering rules. The good news is that we have managed to cover almost all of our options and haven't significantly sacrificed filtering quality. <clears throat> to maintain the quality of filtering at the desired level, we need to keep out filters or rule sets in declarative syntax up to date at all times. To achieve this, we have established a two-day and build and update cycle for the extension, ensuring that the filters embedded in the extension always reach users when needed. After we compiled the filters, we test our extension using integration test, where, where we tried to cover all possible ad blocking methods and test all cases. You can access our test at the test cases at agrd.dev. Uh, as shown on the slide. After test, we send extension for review with auto-publishing. Next one, about our declarative converter. Inside our prototype, we have the declarative converter, which ensures a seamless transition of all our filtering rules accumulated over many years to the new declarative syntax. It is used in two places. First one, during the preparation of static filters when building the extension. Second, it performs on-the-fly conversion for user-defined rules and custom filters added by users. As a result, we obtain a set of static rule sets that are embedded in the extension 
into our extension and one rule set assembled from dynamic rules. So what problems have we incurred and continue to face this day? One of our biggest challenges that obstacles us from maintaining filtering and the desired level is the limitation of the number of rules and filters. This slide depicts the number of filters provided by top ad blockers out of the box. The current limit is represented in blue line and it doesn't satisfy all ad blockers. Therefore, we proposed increase it to the orange level at 100 rule sets to cover all the needs of all, all ad blockers. The extension of the limit has already been supported by browser developers teams and it's currently being discussed in their internal browser meetings. <laughs> A similar issue exists in the entire level. Uh, to maintain the filtering level without updating the application, we constantly update filters in our ad blocker using so-called differential updates. These updates contain a list of rules uh, changes over a certain period of time. If we take, for example, three or six weeks uh, update cycle, then the number of such rules will exceed the limit of all dynamic rules, including user rules, and that's it. Therefore, we also proposed raising the limit to 30,000 rules, which has already been supported by browser developers teams, especially Chrome. Thanks for the related proposal from uh, Oliver and his team. Yes. Uh, next one. Perhaps the most uh, significant issue that reduced ad blocking effectiveness was dying service worker. At the time of our prototype release, its maximum less lifespan was five minutes, sometimes even less. The problem uh, for us was that for every service worker revival, we spent about two or maybe three seconds for, uh, on reinitializing the filtering engine. During this time, all ads that were not blocked by D and R, and there were quite a lot of them, for example, cosmetic rules, scriptlets, and so on, slipped through our protection. A temporary solution to this problem involved constant messaging between service worker and the script injected into browser page. Then the Chrome team improved this mechanism and currently when there are messaging of or API usage, the lifetime lifespan of uh, is automatically extended and can be significantly longer than five minutes. But unfortunately, this is still a not uh, a suitable solution. We, and we are still waiting for a proper one. Well, it works, thank God, but we're forced to use it. One of the non-obvious challenges of the transition was that our filtering rules had a very ambitious priority scheme, consist of four levels, as shown on this slide. And base concept was pretty simple, only four levels without any weights, but there were, a, there were a large number of exemptions that were not covered by these four levels and were described as hacks. The ambiguity of our scheme lay in the fact that to reduce its complexity, it was necessary to introduce several hidden exceptions. However, in DNR, a much more flexible system of priorities for rules was introduced. We can assign any integer priority to each rule. To make the most efficient use of these new features, we completely update our weighting scheme for calculating priorities and transfer to a declarative rails. Now, each rule calculates its weight at the moment of conversion based on the modifiers it contains. Each group of modifiers is assigned either a fixed weight or a weight calculated according to a formula. But some problems could be solved more uh, elegantly. Uh, let's go on. One minute. Here. Let's take a closer look at how our declarative converter works in detail. As I mentioned earlier, we have two entry points, converting static rules before extension assembly and on the fly conversion for dynamic rules. The conversion library works as follows. First, there is a validation check for the specified limits. Then we filter out only network rules from provided filters. We convert 
each of the rules individually into DNR syntax. Then we package the obtained set of rules into a rule set and a separate metadata file. Metadata file. If the limits were exceeded, we trim the rule set to the required constraints and return it to the client code, then, which uh, then passes these rule sets to the browser for ad blocking. To further explain, uh, let's, take let's take a closer look at how the bad filter modifier works. Bad filter is a special type of rule that can cancel out another rule. The slide illustrated an example where there are static filter and user rules. A rule from the user filter cancel the rule present in the static filter. This is also work in the reverse direction and resulting in only one rule being loaded into our filtering engine. One of the most challenging parts is implementing this bad filter modifier. To implement its functionality with DNR during the conversion of static rule sets, static filters I mean, we create a separate dictionary with hashes for all such bad filter rules and save it in a separate metadata file. Then, during the conversion of dynamic rules, we use this dictionary to filter out dynamic rules canceled by the rules from the static rules. After that, we also create a dictionary of hashes for dynamic bad filter rules. And then, in the final step, using the hash dictionary from dynamic section, we select static rules that should be canceled. We cancel these rules using the new update static rules API. <coughs> Another example is the remove param rules. Uh, this type of rule remove URL params from HTTP request, such as UTM tags. When co converting such rules, we encourage a situation where if we convert two remove param rules into two DNAR rules, but they have the same condition, matching condition section, only one of them would work. This is because they operate using uh, redirects and only one would execute and the second one wouldn't get a chance to run. To fix it, we configure the converter to perform post-processing of rules and merge similar rules with the same condition into one single rule uh, in DNR syntax. Third example, uh, cookie rules. Uh, these rules prohibit the setting of cookies. When converting these rules, we encourage limitation in DNR. Currently, these types of rules are converted in two ways. If a rule contains uh, any, par if rule doesn't contain any parameters, such as cookie names or expiration times, uh, we can convert it into DNR and remove the entire HTTP header that sets uh, or, s or sends cookies. So, I mean, we can uh, entirely remove header from the request. But if our rule contain any parameters, we have, to use, uh, we have to use the browser cookies API to manually delete the, those cookies. In addition to this, in both cases from the content script side, we ensure that no client code can modify cookies via document cookies API. And the uh, third part, I would like to present several ideas that could improve DNR and make it even safer and more declarative. First one, uh, the idea is of every free is to have uh, is to have extension with fewer permissions by default. However, ad blockers without permissions are still exist in every free due to the lack of cosmetic rules, for example. We propose it uh, converting these cosmetic rules into a declarative format so that we can specify to the browser which CSS rules should be injected into the page as early as possible to block ads. The good news is that this approach has been supported by browsers, but there is still long road ahead until it can be fully implemented. And the next one proposal, uh, similarly, we propose it uh, handling scriptlets, which protects user and the programmatic level. Scriptlets are a special type of rule, essentially JavaScript code, that executed in the browser page, but with tightly fixed restrictions, allowing only function, functions from a pro an approved list to be used. 
the complete list of scriptlets available for use uh, is accessible on our repository on the GitHub. This proposal is still in an earlier stage of discussion, but we are also conf conf confident that it will contribute to making AMV free and more secure platform. So that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I would be glad to answer any question you may have. All right. Thank you, Dimitri. Where shall we throw the catch box first? Ooh, way over there. All right. Ready? Hi. Um, Hi. Do you like uh, use your MV3 on uh, better, or you like um, when you are going to go to the prod with MV3? What you're thinking about uh, this step? Uh, your question about uh, what uh, we think at Edgard about MV3, yes, and how? No, I mean. Uh, your current prod version now on MV2 or MV3? Uh, our current extension works uh, uh, on MV2 version, and yeah. we have a separated uh, application prototype yeah. with MV3, we, where we are trying to test this MV3, trying to convert this declarative new converter. Also, we face it another problem to get a smooth, smooth transition between MV2 and MV3. For all of uh, our million of users, we separated our filtering engine into a separated library called TS URL filter and also TS web extension. So we hope that someday we can uh, uh, slightly uh, move from one UI to another and the core uh, filtering will be the same. Mm. Okay. All right, going over this way, you want to assist on that one? Ooh, got the rebound. Look at that. All right, going over some heads. Pay attention there. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, one of the or some of the stated goals of uh, the manifest V3 transition were performance improvements and security improvements. And I'm yeah, curious, yeah, yeah. Now that you have a relatively mature <laughs> implementation, how would you evaluate um, MV3? Um, I think the main idea of MV3 is pretty good to get uh, extension with fewer permissions. But uh, thanks to the web extension community group, we can discuss uh, this limitation. And we can uh, make DNR uh, really declarative, safer, and performance. And I think this is possible, but only if we, c we will continue to discuss this limitation and these changes. I see. And have you done any specific uh, performance benchmarks, for example? Or? Uh, especially for MV3, I think no. Uh, we have uh, general test cases for all uh, our um, extensions. And we use them um, for uh, the bot uh, applications, extensions, I mean, for MV2 and MV3. The difference is that uh, for MV3, we um, um, turned off some modifiers because of the limitation. For example, cookies or remove param. But uh, seems like performance is the same for several, with several limitations. For example, range analyzing uh, our filtering engine on service work diet and but it's pretty the same as our main extension, I think. I see. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question about the differential updates that you talked about. Yes. I, I didn't uh, fully understand. Did you try it out, or was it just a concept that you explored and uh, never really started implementing it? Uh, actually, uh, as I know correctly, uh, we use differential updates in our main extension, because we cannot um, uh, update our extension to uh, uh, every day, like or every two days. This approach works for MV3 version, because there, there are not so much users, and we can experiment with them. But for main extension, we should not um, update every day, but maybe every 
two or maybe three weeks. And for this period, we calculated this differential of data. And this uh, scheme already uh, works in our main extension. When you install uh, Edguard, Edblocker, you uh, just select for uh, which period uh, each filter should be updated. And you can select 10 hours, maybe three days, and that's it. So the data on the slide will be cal uh, was calculated based on this uh, or our, from our based on data from our filter registry and um, um, we trying we tried to calculate how um, how many changes in these filters and this is tr i can i can um, maybe link the proposal with raw data and you can see from from which Oh, sorry. <laughs> I've got, got some behind you, Yanzi. Yeah. Right. Thanks. It was a great presentation and really interesting to see Thank the you. progress you made. I'm curious about the rule sets that are yeah. not working anymore. You said that there's some features that are unsupported. Is there like a, could you publish a list of the incompatible rule sets? Yeah, we already uh, have. Um, separated section in our uh, core uh, filtering uh, library called TSURL filter. We have a separated declarative uh, folder where we described all uh, limitation about MV3. Okay, how, how, my, how, like what percentage of the rules? Uh, uh, as I said, probably uh, we have uh, strong problems with um, only three uh, Modifiers, uh, yes. that's, uh, uh, I, as I remember correctly, uh, redirect rule, uh, content, and replace. And uh, some of them also, for example, domain header, pop up, URL broke, stales, uh, works, but not fully. Uh, yes. So I'm curious how, what percentage of the actual rules are affected by the missing features? Uh, um, what does it mean, rules? So, uh, one individual rule which says block this thing, which uses that feed, uh, like content or uh, redirect rule. Um, I mean, uh, you you wanna uh, that I'm said how much percentage of our filters? Yeah. So, if you have a, a, a filter list with ten rules and yeah. one of them uses content, that would be you know ten yeah. percent, one out of ten. So how, how many of the rules are actually? Yeah, I, I think that this, this uh, uh, digit is uh, truly 85 percent, uh, maybe several, yes, is working. Yeah, sorry, I understood that as 85 percent of the actual modifiers, not 85 percent of the. No, oh, you based our. F uh, mm, it depends because it depends on what uh, filter we should test. Maybe if we said about Edgar base filter, it will okay, be okay. Uh, 95. If right. we take uh, another uh, filter we, where we collect only remove param rules, there can be maybe 60 percent. I don't know. So it, yeah. it it really depends from uh, from a set of filters. Okay, cool. Thanks. I'm curious, like, how much is affected by this? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I, one other quick question. Do you yeah. know of any other people who are doing similar work to this? Like, um, three with content blocking? In uh, your block, uh, there is the uh, same uh, transition to MV3, and uh, sometimes I show how it works on them. Sometimes uh, I think they uh, show how, it, how we worked and um, quick, quick question. So the post-processing pipeline that you've shown, this is after th when the user like installs the ad blocker? Uh, this happens after. Uh, you mean post-processing of rules yeah. or bad filter? Uh, of the rules. Uh, wh what uh, post-processing you mean? Um, with the static plus the dynamic and the user custom. Oh, okay. Uh, we have a post-processing uh, on the fly conversion uh, and uh, separated in two ways. So as I described it, we have two ways and we have a post-processing for each of them. When we converted uh, static rules, we have a post process to check if we maybe... No, um, uh, th does this happen after the user installs it? Is, is, is that how? Is that it, what you mean? It not depends on user install. No, it, it depends uh, on uh, when uh, when conversion happens. Okay, okay. So I'm asking this because it looks like what happens when the user has multiple ad blockers installed? Is each ad blocker running their own um, conversion pipelines? Um, going to slow mm -hmm. down the experience for users. Is 
uh, you talk about situation where the user have several ad blockers and uh, um, really I don't know what to say because there are another problems with uh, MV3 uh, limitation between uh, extension, but this is out of topic and we can discuss and uh, coffee break, I think. We do have a coffee break coming up, so plenty of time for more questions, everything. Dimitri, uh, let's hear it for him. Thank you.